Jennifer, welcome. Thank you. Please introduce yourself. I'm Jennifer Bishop Jenkins, and I'm from Northfield, Illinois. I understand uh, you are the founder uh, of an organization. Yes, it's the National Organization of Victims of Juvenile Lifers. What is that? NOVJL. Well, we, uh, uh, when I realized that there was an effort um, that could f potentially free my sister's killer, and particularly with this um, emphasis on going to parole hearings for the rest of our lives that they were proposing, something that would just be literally torture for my mother, for my children. Um, I, I, I realized uh, I was politically savvy enough to know I needed to organize to oppose it and find others like me. And um, so I started you know, just Googling people and calling state's attorneys and got, uh, found a couple of other families like me and we decided that the best way to protect our voices in this national public policy debate was to actually form an organization, which we and did. And you have a website? We do. It's which is? JLWOP Victims, and that stands for Juvenile Life Without Parole, JLWOP Victims.org. And, and as you and I have discussed, uh, it's really the best resource out there in the country because you've spent so much time collecting information from I've, around the country. I, I've tried to put up everything I could find on the subject, pro, con, offender, victim, anywhere in between. I've, I've put up links to studies. It is the best website on the topic in the nation because it has everything, every report ever published, links to everything I could find, news stories from every state. It's got advocacy organization links. It's, it's very comprehensive. Now, like all organizations uh, that are essentially community-based from the grassroots up, you're looking for funding, and obviously mm -hmm. you'd be more than happy to accept funding from anyone who would want to We have no pass funding. We're you. just all volunteers. I, I do this strictly on my own. I, I knew nothing about the Internet. My husband is an author of a book, and he had a website, so he taught me how to do it. I just do it on my own little home computer. It would be really nice because we have so many victims that are you know, s uh, really in need. It would be good to get our voices out there in the public policy debate. Now, um, let's talk about the public policy debate. You've had the opportunity to testify before uh, the U.S. Congress, mm -hmm. and also your voice has been heard in your state That's right. uh, many times. That's right. Uh, let's first focus on your state. What is the current state of play in your state regarding mm -hmm. the availability of life without parole for a juvenile killer or violent teen? Is it, is it on? The books? Oh yes, Illinois has, um, uh, the, the adult age in Illinois is 17. Offenders between the age of 13 and 17 can be tried as adults if the offense is serious enough, but it has to rise to a very high level. It's only if it is uh, killing multiple people, as in my family's case, or killing a police officer, or raping and killing a child, uh, that kind of thing. Those are the only kinds of offenses that rise to that level. So if you're and a 13 or 14 year old in Illinois and you kill one person... You can't get the sentence. No, a 16, 16 year old can't get it for one. You, you can't even get life without parole as an adult for just killing one person. It has to be an aggravated, highly aggravated offense. So you get a, a, a one person freebie in Illinois for killing one person. You sort don't of. suffer... <laughs> The death penalty, and you don't suffer even life without parole sort of, yeah. Uh, yeah. for killing one person in Illinois. It has to be aggravated in some way. I see. Yeah. And so, and, and one of the things that uh, Illinois, there's no 13 year olds that have the sentence, even though it's available. Um, there's only like four 14 year olds, uh, almost no 14 and 15 year olds. Huge numbers of 16 year olds and 70, that's like 35, 16 year olds, and there's some 50, some 17 year olds, but the offender advocates are arguing that they are juvenile lifers, and in fact they're not because Illinois, they would be sentenced as an adult anyway. 17 is an adult in Illinois. Right. Well, we know from some of these national studies, is in fact the, the biggest national study, the mm -hmm. so called study, the Amnesty International Human Rights Watch, right. uh, they define juveniles in their study as people. Uh, below 20. So 19-year-olds and 18-year-olds in their study are juveniles, right. whereas we know all states consider 18 and 19-year-olds adults. Yeah, they're not reading the state laws, that's for sure. 
Let's talk about your testimony before the U.S. Congress and how that came about. What, what is it that brought you there? Is there a bill up there? Yes. What's going on? There's H.R. 2289, which last legislative session was H.R. 4300, sponsored by Congressman Bobby Scott of Richmond, Virginia. Who, Who's a good guy. Yeah, he's been he's very chairman helpful. of the Crime Subcommittee, uh, you know, seems to be, you know, was respectful in, in meeting with us and, and helpful. He's been helpful with the Heritage Foundation's joint effort with with the National Association Excellent. of Criminal Defense Attorneys yeah. and others on overcriminalization. Good. But this bill is disturbing to you. Yeah, and because part of my concern with his personal philosophy on this issue is that he believes somehow that parole is some sort of right and that every offender should have it. And that was a, a different discussion. But the, the most troubling part is that when the bill first was brought up, they held hearings on the subject without a single opposition voice. They had only uh, families of offenders uh, and defense attorneys. Those are the only people that they allow, and advocates for, uh, for the anti-incarceration advocates. Well, yeah. when you're in the majority, you do get the privilege of calling whoever you want. That's right. Both parties do that. Right. But I was outraged by the exclusion of the voices because the very offender advocates... The voices of the victims. That's correct. Okay. Because the very offender advocates who are, you know, trying to change public policy on this, on this issue are people who say they believe in restorative justice and other such philosophy approaches to, to criminal justice that would advocate bringing all stakeholders to the table. If the victims of these crimes are not stakeholders in this discussion, I don't know who is, and I don't know how you can have a conversation about juvenile life without parole or any other issue like this without having the victims of these crimes at the table and the prosecutors, both of whom were excluded. But you got to appear when I called this them up, spring. Yeah, I called them up and said, you know, you need to include a victim on the panel. They refused, so I called the Republicans, the minority, and said, would you please allow victims? They were, and they were very happy to accommodate me. So I, I was, uh, even though I'm personally a Democrat, I found that very interesting. But you don't see this issue this as is Republican not a partisan, or Democrat. This is not. This isn't liberal or conservative. It is not. It is a completely bipartisan issue. It's, a, it's an issue of public safety. It's an issue of law. It's an issue of... Um, violent crime is a is a very non-discriminatory, um, you know, act. Violent crime hits the suburbs, it hits the inner city, it hits the rural areas. Violent crime and vicious, brutal murders and bad people, p bad people who are capable of committing horrible, horrible crimes happen everywhere. Now, now you and I have talked about this before. Um, you're personally opposed to the death penalty. I am personally opposed to the death penalty. And you've penalty. worked... Uh, mm -hmm for uh, the abolition of the death penalty. Correct. Um, yet people may be watching this video saying, well, then how can she be for life without the possibility of parole? Could you explain that? Well, the death penalty for me was a matter of my being unwilling to be like the offender. If I'm going to say that killing is wrong, then I can't be willing to do it myself. And I believe that that makes me too much like him to be willing to participate vengefully in his execution. But that's an entirely different question than what is the appropriate thing to do with somebody who is so dangerous that he could do this. And really, it's a matter of public safety. It's very, very clear. In our case, the offender is just absolutely unrepentant sociopath who is to this day still dangerous and still in denial. And, and it's, it's an extremely serious thing. Look, here's, here's the deal. There's six and a half billion people on planet Earth. And sheer random chance is going to make some of them bad. The variations of our species are six and a half billion and there's going to be some that are bad and I know that there are hard, it's hard for people to recognize, they don't want to recognize that there are some people on this earth that are bad people, but there are. And there are some that are so bad that they cannot walk among us. Summarize as succinctly as you can um, your testimony uh, before uh, Chairman Scott's committee mm -hmm. earlier this spring. I was very concerned about the retroactivity proposal. When Which means that if the law was passed, even people who got juvenile life without parole would be out from under those sentences. Correct. And it, it, this is a violation of due process and, and legal standard by any way you want to argue it. To retroactively say to a victim's family member and to the entire community, you know, that work together to apprehend, investigate, apprehend, try, convict, um, and, and incarcerate this very dangerous man, um, to say retroactively now that parole must be an option 
when it never could have been. Here's what happened in our case. We, because 20 years ago we walked away being told quite correctly that in Illinois he cannot ever get out except by an act of clemency by the governor, which we knew would never happen. We walked away and we did not get the jurors' names and phone numbers. We did not get the judge's contact information. We did not pay several thousand dollars to order up a full transcript of the hearing, particularly of the, tri I mean of the trial and particularly of the sentencing aspect of the trial where the judge made a speech clearly laying out why he was giving this discretionary sentence to this young offender and saying, he even predicted, he said 20 years from now I predict somebody might even try to get you out because of your age and let me tell you why you deserve this because you're a very privileged home and because you, you know, all, I mean, he laid, laid down the litany of the reasons. Uh, we don't have that transcript. We don't have access to the jurors. We don't have access to my father who was the one who found their bodies and who's the best eyewitness to the carnage of the crime scene. He's, he's died. We didn't videotape him before he died. So it essentially re-victimizes the victims if it passed. And if we're to be expected to go to parole hearings every few years for the rest of our life, I mean, I, I, I can't even articulate how torturous that idea would be. Just, just the going through the trial was a nightmare beyond proportions. Now to there, have to do that all the time, it would just be impossible for there's us. There's some other aspects of your, your testimony before Congress uh, that I think merit just a brief highlight. Uh, right. Could you touch on three or four of those quickly? Yeah, I, I, I complained mightily about the fact that these, uh, these cases are extremely serious. There are so many offenders that have done such brutal, brutal crimes. One of them is um, a man who killed 12-year-old uh, uh, Victoria Larson. Vicki Larson was um, raped and murdered by a, man, a young man who was already out on parole. He already had his second chance, and he used it to rape and murder Vicki Larson. He had dug her grave three days before she died. There was a case in Chicago of a 17-year-old who raped a five-year-old in a Chicago housing project and then flung her body out of an open 14-story window and she caught the ledge and as she was screaming, Mommy, Mommy, please come help and save me, Mommy, Mommy, a five-year-old, he walked over to the ledge and lifted her fingers and pu pushed her to her death. You know, these are not impulsive acts. These are callous actions of disregard for human life by people who are old enough to know better. Well, you mentioned in your testimony before Congress that you believe that the anti-incarceration advocates uh, have misapplied the brain development research. Talk about that. The, the brain research is completely, they're, they're in love with this theory. It's, it's wrong. I, I'm, I've got a, a graduate degree in psychology and they're just, they're just wrong about this. The frontal lobe... What is their theory? Their just theory in one is, sentence. Their theory is that the frontal lobe is not fully developed into, until the mid-20s and therefore you're not fully culpable. But culpability for human behavior actually starts from, you know, earliest childhood and it, it gradually matures. So we you can't hold our kids accountable at uh, 12 when they break their curfew. We can't hold them accountable when they're 13 for lying about... Because there's emotional reasoning, there's physiological development. Development is not just cognitive and it's not just the frontal lobe. It's everything. It's emotional, psychological, physical, endocrine systems with the hormones. Every, it, there's all of these things come to play in, in development. And to imply that the frontal lobe is somehow only the only thing I at issue would imply that therefore we are all by our own nature as murderers and it's only the frontal lobe that keeps us from killing. And of course we all know that that's not true. And if you really relied on the frontal lobe as your only source of, of um, you know, moderation of behavior, you couldn't hold anybody culpable until well into their 30s. So it really, it, it's not the function of the frontal lobe. Yes, the frontal lobe is not fully, fully developed, but that's not what makes you culpable for behavior. What would you like to add uh, in conclusion uh, as the founder of this organization, as a person whose family member was brutally murdered uh, by a juvenile, um, who's been at the forefront of the state and now federal legislative efforts. Um, and by the way, the, the, the federal bill has really no support. I mean, it's going nowhere. They, they Thank told goodness. us that, yeah, right. Yeah, I mean, it has two sponsors and it's... That's it. That's it. Yeah. Um, w what would you like to say? I'd like to say that the offender advocates in this debate have shocked me. 
And these are people that I want to believe have been very well-meaning. I think they're, you know, respectful people. Many of them are kind, good-hearted people. And you've actually worked, worked with, with them against, them the, against, against the, the death, death penalty. penalty. These are many, many of them are, are people I have known for years in my work against the death penalty. I've been shocked at their um, disingenuous approach toward victims of these crimes, their, in, their unwillingness to recognize the impact of their proposals on victims' families, their refusal to put any resources toward out victim outreach or support, um, their uh, willingness to just lie about the cases or at least not seek correct full information. They interview the offenders only. They publish their version of the facts in shock of shocks. The offenders actually lie sometimes about their cases. And they publish those facts without researching by talking to the victims, by looking into the facts of the cases. I have been very distressed at the amount of times that I have tried to reach out to dialogue to bring a genuine dialogue to this and really try to compromise and, and, and um, discuss openly and really have a public policy debate. And I, I've been surprised at um, their unwillingness to do this. You've read the Heritage Foundation's new book, uh, Adult Time for Adult Crimes. Um, in it, we, uh, by publishing it, we hope that uh, we will now finally be able to have a forthright, honest, and direct debate based on facts, Yes. Uh, not spin, uh, not lobbying efforts that are misguided with false information. Uh, what is your hope for not only your website, but also the impact that this new book will have? Well, I, exactly as you say, I really want to see this public policy debate happen based on facts. I have been very disturbed by the published pictures in Illinois of children who were single-digit, you know, child, age child actors that they put out as representing somehow what these offenders are like. Now, the offenders in Illinois are, you know, are the teenagers. Cases, they are they are almost adults or adults who have done some brutal things repeatedly. They have they they've had to rise to such a level that they've given the prosecutors no choice because they they've tried everything else. It's been a very uh, th there's a real. Uh, um, um, cognitive dissonance between the reality of these crimes and what the offender advocates have been saying. And so I'm really grateful for the report because the report actually shows what the offender, you know, what the offender looks like instead of their childhood picture. Uh, it actually shows victims. It actually talks about the crimes. There has not been a single offender advocacy publication that I have seen that actually describes the crimes for which these people have been incarcerated. Or provides court documents or judges' findings. Nothing. I mean, there, there's, there, there's, it's almost as if they, they didn't commit crimes and nobody can figure out from reading these documents why these poor children are incarcerated. It's almost as if they haven't done anything. And, you know, there's, there's pages in the Illinois report, for example, about how they can't marry and how they can't have children and all how these poor children have to live six hours away from their family that they can't visit. There's no acknowledgement whatsoever that these people committed brutal, horrible, pre-planned, cold-calculated mass murders. And you're using the word children in quotes because, of course, that's the language that they use. That they use. When, yeah. in fact, they're juveniles. All they're juvenile people offenders, in yeah. the criminal justice system call teenagers juveniles. And every single one of those cases, they were certified by a court of law to be an adult for the purposes of, uh, uh, of these actions. And it, it, you know, that is the right of the states to do that. It is how they define, you know, adult definitions vary from state to state, where you can drink, where you can drive, where you can buy cigarettes, and where you can vote. No, I mean, oh, well, voting is set nationally, but I mean, the, these numbers vary from state to state, where you can sign contracts and so on. And that is the purview of states to do that. And these, um, these young offenders have been committing very serious crimes, and I have yet to see a single acknowledgement of that by any of the offender advocates. And it's just, it's stunning. Um, that they haven't, I guess not surprising, because then they have to really talk about what they've done and they don't want to do that. So, Jennifer, thank you very much and good luck with your website thank and your you. organization. Thank you.